you've heard the old line that everything rises and falls on leadership. And certainly that's true in a very personal sense in our homes. I remember uh, the first time that we were in, I think Colorado, we were in a little cabin and I told the kids, they said, hey, we're, we're off here in the woods and we're not going to be able to go to, to church tomorrow. And you would have thought that I had just shot their bunny rabbit or denied the faith. I mean, they looked at me like, are we still Christians? <laughs> and uh, so I, my, my little ones, I, the next morning, I think we held a little Bible study, you know, uh, Peyton sang, and then Ethan did announcements, and I, and I taught a little bit, <laughs> because it really hit me, like, these kids are watching, and I think we all would agree that where our daddy goes and mommy goes, ultimately the, the family goes, and certainly that is true on a macro level uh, as well. There's an old story that R.C. Sproul tells about a, a Jewish lad, a Jewish boy, and he was in Germany, and growing up, his family was Orthodox Jew, very faithful. They would go to the synagogue every single week, and uh, when they moved towns, there was no synagogue. And so the story goes that the dad, with only a Lutheran church in town, said, hey guys, sorry, we're not Jewish anymore. As of this Sunday, we're going to be Lutheran. And so they all went to the Lutheran church, they got home, and this little guy was bewildered, the family was bewildered, they looked at Papa and said, why are we doing this? And his Dad said, because it's good for business. That little guy grew up frustrated. He grew up confused. He grew up embittered. And of course, the story goes that he went to England, sat down, and ended up writing a manifesto where he said that religion is nothing but an opiate for the masses. Uh, he was none other than Karl Marx. A reminder that what a father does, what a leader does, has an impact on not only one, but on potentially many. Everything does rise and fall on leadership, humanly speaking. And of course, that is most imperative where? In the church. Absolutely vital that we have honest leaders in the church and trustworthy leaders in the church. You have this beautiful organization that Jesus started. And he said, I'm going to call out a group of people before time. I'm going to redeem them in time. And I'm going to hold on to them for all time. And it's an organization that I, in fact, am going to bless. It's going to be my means of active grace. It's going to be my channel of truth. It's going to be the very thing that I'll use to, to pull people out of the kingdom of darkness. And I'm going to, to take them from the, the clutches of Satan and put them into the kingdom of light. And so if there were one institution upon planet Earth that absolutely must have honest and trustworthy leadership, it is none other than the church. And that's what prompts Paul. You're going to see this morning. Make the turn. You ready? From the pastors in the pulpit to the pew. After two chapters of talking about the pastors and the elders and the deacons and the leaders and what they should be doing, he now makes the turn and he talks to all of the congregation and he says, now guys, here's how you are to respond to your pastors. If they're trustworthy, if they're moral, if they're upstanding and biblical, then you want to care for them. You want to protect them and love them. But if they're untrustworthy and they're not doing the right thing, then they absolutely have got to go. And so if you have your Bibles, open them with me again to 1 Timothy chapter 5, and let's pick it up in verse 17 this morning. Uh, and you're going to see that Paul is really clear about how the church has to be led. I mean, it's paramount that the church is led with integrity. Uh, and he says, if it is, then you as a congregation want to cheer and applaud and support. And if it's not, uh, then you have to make sure that these guys get the boot and they get it quick. And so we're going to work through just four quick imperatives, and they'll be obvious for you. They'll be on the screen, uh, and then we'll be able to go home, and you guys can finish your, your Thanksgiving shopping. So here we go. Number one, it's going to be right there in verse 17. I'm going to put it on the screen for you. I've put them all in a plural sense so we can think about them and chew on them together. Is Paul's going to say that we must be diligent in our care of church leaders. We as a congregation all need to be diligent in how we care for our church leaders. 1 Timothy 5 verse 17 begins with a big imperative. Let the elders, in English that feels soft, but in the Greek it would be an imperative. This must happen. Let the elders who rule well, or the elders who rule well, must be considered worthy of double honor especially those who work hard at preaching 
and teaching. And so you can kind of work through every one of those words with me there. Let those who rule well, the elders are the broad term again for overseers. We talked about it three weeks ago. He says those who rule well means just leading well, modeling well, setting the pace well, teaching truth and defending from error. Let them be considered worthy of double honor. That's, that's, that's double weight. It can also mean support or care financially. You could add in there. Especially those, he zeroes in on those who work hard at the preaching and teaching, the logos ministry, the word-based ministry, okay? And then he moves on in verse 18, and he explains via illustration and kind of unpacks it for us. He says, for the scriptures say, number one, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and number two, in quote, the labor is worthy of his wages. And so he supports his big declaration in two ways. Number one, he points back to the Old Testament, the law and Moses in Deuteronomy 25, and number two, he points to Jesus uh, in Luke chapter 10, verse 7. And he says from the Old Testament, of course, going all the way back to the law in Deuteronomy 25, he says, Moses told us that when there was an ox that was threshing, and I know today we don't really have a lot of oxen in our backyard threshing, but if you were, they would be in a little circular pen, and they'd be going in a circle with a threshing board behind them that would be separating the wheat kernels from the chaff. And the whole idea there is you never would put a, mu a muzzle on the ox while he was threshing because then he would, wouldn't be able to eat. And instead, you wanted to let him kind of pick at the wheat as he went so he could feed himself and enjoy doing his job as opposed to being distracted and burdened and looking for ways to go find water or food. So obviously, the illustration that Paul uses for the pastorate and the elderate, uh, the elders, sorry, is that he says, hey, listen, you don't want to muzzle them. You want them to be able to freely eat and freely move so they're not always looking for side jobs and bivocational opportunities and they can focus on their role. That's why he adds in the statement by Jesus in Luke chapter 10, verse 7, where Jesus said in regards to the secular system, even the secular world pays fair wages to their workers. And so what you have here is just a baseline, friends, for how a congregation cares for the pastors. Uh, basically, he draws out and says there's a general eldership in a church. There's a group of men who, they basically plot the course for the church together. They set the pace. They're morally qualified. That's the eldership. And then he zeroes in on a smaller group of men who he calls do the word work or the ministry, the full-time ministry of teaching and preaching God's word. And he says those are the ones that will often be paid for it. That's, that's the picture there, right? The Greek word is chiefly. They're chiefly sweating over the ministry of the word. And that, of course, is why churches, if you've ever wondered, Mission Bible included, have a group of elders, broadly speaking, and then they'll have a group of staff pastors who do the full-time work of ministry throughout the week, right? It reminds me a little bit of the old story. <laughs> it's kind of funny. You know, the little boy who walked up to his pastor and he tugged on his sleeve. And he said, Pastor, the man looked down, he said, what is it, son? And he said, one day, I'm telling you right now, I'm going to give you all my money. The pastor looked down and he said, well, why is that? <laughs> he said, because my daddy on the drive home always says you're the poorest preacher we've ever had. <laughs> I, sorry, I just like that joke. You know, just remember when you're on your way home and talking about us, the kids are listening and someday, you know, they'll come up and tell us what you're actually saying. But maybe you come in the room today you know, and you're going, I never really understood why churches pay pastors. I always wondered about that. You know, people do. They wonder those things. Why would you pay a guy to go sit in an office and study the Bible all day and come talk for 38 minutes? Well, this is one of about three texts in the Bible that give us the reason why. In effect, here's what Paul's saying. He's saying, there is going to be a church that's so hungry for the Word of God and understands the eternal value of the Word of God to the point that they're going to say, hey, listen, we're going to feed you so that you can spend all your time feeding us. That's the heartbeat of this text. We're going to try to feed you so that you can spend all your time feeding us. That's the heart of it, which leads to number two. Number one, we must be diligent in our care of church leaders. Now, again, this is assuming you'll see in a second that they're trustworthy and they're upstanding and they're biblical and they're spiritual and they're walking in the ways of God. And number two, we must be strong in our protection of church leaders. So, so number one, there's a diligence in caring for them, assuming that they're God-fearing men. Number two is that we must be strong in our protection of them. You'll see it in verse 19. He says, do not 
receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. And so obviously Paul knows that Timothy is in an uphill battle. You know, Satan is going to to hurl every arrow he can at Timothy and at the elders at Ephesus. And he says, we're not going to do the frivolous stuff here. We're not going to let every threat and every accusation be something that takes you out. We're going to make sure that there are witnesses and there are evidence for the things that are brought against the leaders of the church. And I trust this morning that everyone understands why this is so important. I mean, the the reality, friends, let's just be honest, is that there's never going to be a true pastor, preacher, or teacher who is publicly declaring the truth against the kingdom of darkness who Satan is not going to fire, fire, fire an arrow at. There's never going to be a preacher or teacher of the truth who Satan is not going to try to take out and create subterfuge for. That's just a reality. In fact, if you take the Bible and you look at it all the way from Job to Moses to, to David to Jeremiah to Nehemiah to Joseph all the way to Jesus and Paul, You just literally are always going to see the fact that Satan's not going to sit back on his laurels and go, hey, I'm the prince of the power of the air, and there's these truth tellers that are out there, and they're taking souls from me, and they're bringing them to King Jesus. Oh, by the way, hey, demons, let's just let that fly. Which is why the old Puritans used to always say that truth always has a scarred face. He's always coming for people that are teaching the truth and trying to take them out. So so really what Paul's doing here is he's building in a little bit of a safety clause for the churches, you ready, that tend to be what we call pastor killers. You go, there's no way there's churches like that. No, there are churches like that. Absolute pastor killers. And I've had the opportunity to travel the country and talk with man after man after man after man who have been a part of a pastor killer church. A church that literally is assassinating pastors. You know, they'll bring a guy in for the honeymoon phase and candidating, and they're smiling, and they're saying, come on in, we love you, pastor. Oh, just just teach and preach to us any way that you want. And then within about a year after the honeymoon's over, whammo, they're ready to fire him. Then they bring in the interim, and then they bring in the next interim, and then the next guy, literally 20 pastors over 20 years. There's some patriarchal figure in the background, some old deacon who wants to be in charge of the church, and they'll never let a pastor truly shepherd them. In fact, I knew one old pastor who wrote a little book called They Who Cannot Leave. And I may have told you about this before. It's a fascinating little book because his premise is asking the question, Why would church people continue to stay in a church when they're always unhappy and they're always sharing things that are unhappy? Why would they stay in the church? And then he goes on after the exegesis to ask a simple question. He goes, do you go to restaurants that you don't like? (laughs) Everyone goes, not unless my kids make me. And then he goes on and he asks, do you go to amusement parks you don't like? And I've told you before, I don't like Disneyland. I don't like it, not only socio-cultural issues, but I just don't like crowds and sweat and not getting on more than one ride for an entire day. So guess where I don't go? I do not go to Del Taco, sorry. I don't like Del Taco. And I don't go to Disneyland because I don't like Disneyland. I know there's a few of you here in the room. Catherine, who just got hired at Disneyland as a princess, and she's going, how dare you, right? I'll come for you, Catherine. But the point that the pastor makes is, is why would somebody who doesn't want to be at the church, who's unhappy with the church, continue coming to the church, and if he or she was not put there by God and is not wanting to be there of themselves, then who possibly is the one who put them there? And it's a pretty strong argument. Why is there usually somebody inside a church that's always creating problems for the people and the vision and the direction of the church? So what Paul says here is that if there's going to be an actual issue, an accusation brought against the pastor, you want to make sure that it comes with two or three witnesses, that it comes with evidence, 
Because, as Proverbs chapter 18, verse 17 says, the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. Now, I want to pause right there and just add in a little personal note there that this is one of the dangers, friends, of cancel culture. And now, I know you're all feeling it. For a long time in our country, because of our Judeo-Christian background, the sociocultural belief system, the sociocultural law, in quote, was that you were innocent, finish it with me, until proven what? Right? What is it now? You're guilty even if you're proven innocent. Once the court of public opinion has spoken, there's no going back. Now, here's why this is so important. If we want to get along together as a family, and I know you feel this way about your own family, your own friends, and your own work, right, is you want people to take you at your word. And you would never want anybody to come at you and go, hey, this Yelp review said, or this customer said, therefore it must be true. And what Paul says is, is that applies to the church as well. Now, if we were to stop right there, here's the question that we'd all be asking, and you're already asking it. But Tony, does that mean, actually you're not asking me, you're asking Paul. Paul, does that mean then that like pastors can just do whatever they want? Like, like, like we're supposed to just give them a paycheck, and then stand back, and nobody can ever bring an accusation against them. Tony, isn't that what happened with Hillsong? And then you're starting to name off all the big entrepreneurial churches that have fallen over the last five years. That's what you're thinking right now. I know you are because I'm thinking it too, which is why Paul doesn't actually take a step back in the next verse. He takes a step forward, and he gets strong about the leaders. Yes, you care, and you honor, and you protect the trustworthy ones. But look what he says about the immoral ones in verse 20, all right? We must be diligent in our care of church leaders. We must be strong in our protection of church leaders. But look at number three. We must be public in our rebuke of church leaders. He says not only are you going to deal with immoral leaders, you're going to publicly expose them. Verse 20. Those who continue in sin, and if you have your pen out, you want to just kind of underline that because that's a plural present participle. A better way you could write it in the margin to be interpreted would just be the sinning ones. The ones who are going on in sin, the ones who are greedy, the, the ones who are sexually immoral, you know, the ones who are, are spiritually abusing the congregation, the ones who are taking advantage of weak-willed women, the sinning ones. Look what he says rebuke, which means expose, even shame them in the presence of who? Of everybody. And then the Heine clause, so that the rest also may be fearful of sinning, meaning the rest of the pastors and elders, the congregation as well, but primarily that group, they go, we're watching what's happening to that guy, and therefore we're going to be on our face, and we're going to follow the Lord, and we're not going to mess around. So there's no immunity here. In fact, he takes it up a notch and says, there's going to be public censure of a leader when he messes around. And then the reason is in verse 21. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God. Timothy, I am with sober-mindedness charging you. You have to do this. And the reason is you're in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his chosen angels to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing in a spirit of partiality. Timothy, it doesn't matter who your friends are. It doesn't matter who the, 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 the cool crowd is. It doesn't matter who you're hanging out with on the backside, who has all the money. It doesn't matter, Timothy. You're going to do these things without bias. You know why? Because it is Jesus Christ who's Lord of the church. And in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, it says he walks among the lampstands and he says, don't you lose your first love. Don't you go back and fall in with Jezebel. Don't you grow lukewarm because it's my bride and I'm going to purify her and if you don't watch out, I'm coming for you. So the church has to draw a high level of accountability because it's the standard for righteousness in the eyes of a watching world. He says, so you publicly expose men if they have walked in immorality. So it's really important, friends, this morning that you understand what Paul's doing here is saying, yes, if you have trustworthy leaders of integrity, you need to care for them and love them and honor them and protect them. But if you have men who showcase an utter disregard for the things of God, then you stand them up in front of everybody and you publicly discipline them. The bar is extremely high. 
See, he says, if you want to have authority in the church, fine. You also get the responsibility of being judged by everybody. You're going to live in a fishbowl, Timothy. You're going to live in a glass house, Timothy. That's why James 3.1 says, let not many of you become teachers. Why? Because you will incur a stricter what? A stricter judgment. They're all watching you. And that's why, by the way, friends, it's different from Matthew 18. Remember, the goal of church member discipline is private penitence, one step at a time, so that they turn from what they're doing and they fall in line with righteousness. Where did you see here what happens? Even if the man repents, what happens? He's still publicly exposed. And you go, why? Why is that so important? to investigate a man, put the witnesses in front of him, to give him a chance to respond to his accusers, but if he's found guilty, to have him stand up here, why is it so important? And by the way, friends, do you understand the point he's making here? It's not that somebody just comes up and talks about him. He literally is supposed to stand here, give his confession, explain and acknowledge what he's done, talk about how he plans to change, and then redirect the course of his life while everybody watches. And the reason is purity. The true church holds itself accountable because it is the witness in the eyes of a watching world. And if it does not, it becomes a blight on the bride of Christ and all it does is breed suspicion. Now I wanna pause right there and I just wanna talk to um, every man in the room. So men, if you're here in the room and you are one of those, whether you're 30, 40, 50, 60, it doesn't matter on the age, okay? If you're one of those who at some point in your life or in your mind, way back somewhere, just in the recesses, you're going, I've always thought that maybe one day I could be like in church leadership. I've always had a little part inside of me that thought about being in church leadership. A pastor or an elder or, okay, listen, yes. It's a noble work and a good desire. Yes, it's wonderful to work with able-minded, spirit-minded men of God. Yes, there's nothing better this side of heaven than watching the Spirit of God use the Word of God to transform the people of God under the glory of God. Yes, 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 yes. But it'll cost you your life. It'll cost you your privacy. It'll cost you your income. It'll cost you your health. It'll cost you sleepless nights. And you will stand and give an account to the very holy angels of heaven who are watching in judgment. So go slow. Pray deeply. Take it seriously. Because Jesus does. Which is why Paul naturally goes to the next one. You see number four? He says, listen, we've got to diligently care for good church leaders. He says, we have got to to be strong in our protection of, of noble, upstanding church leaders. We've got to openly rebuke those who dare bring a blight upon the bride of Christ. Which leads to number four, we must be wise, or even you could insert slow, in our selection of church leaders. You see it there in verse 22? He says, don't lay hands upon anyone too hastily. Remember two weeks ago, Elijah up here? Okay. Laying hands is not conferring anointing and power. I don't have that. Laying hands is identifying it. Here's what God's doing in the life of a man. He says, don't you do that and lay hands on a young man identifying that this is a gift by Christ to his church. Don't you do that too hastily or look at the outcome. If he sins, you thus share, and this is the word koinonia, by the way, you have a bond of fellowship. You share in the responsibility for the sins of others, meaning his sin or his collapse or his fall, his moral ineptitude. Keep yourself free from sin. He says, when you do that, you lay your hands on a young man. He's not tested, he's not tempered, and he falls. He says, you're complicit in that. You're bonded to that. 
And then in verse 23, no longer drink water exclusively, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. And by the way, on that one, every scholar or commentator you go to, everyone's confused. Because it feels so random to insert that there. Guys are like, well, it's parenthetical and whatever. I think plausibly you could argue that that's in context. Where Paul knows that Timothy is prone at this stage in his young life and ministry towards an ascetic lifestyle, towards what we call cage stage, where he's basically like, I'm not even going to take a little bit of medicine for my tummy. And Paul's trying to remind him, Timothy, as you look at these things, the expectations for young men in ministry, including yourself, remember, it's not what goes into a man that causes him to sin, it's what comes out. So take a little bit of Benadryl and you're going to be okay. You can go work that out on your own, pull a few commentaries. But obviously the point, verse 24, is that the sins of some men are quite evident. Going before them to judgment, remember human evaluation here, he's talking about the pastorate, talking about being an elder, the sins of some men are so evident, it goes right before them to evaluation, but for others, their sins follow after. There's a facade and there's a veneer, and you're not really certain what they're up to, so you gotta give it time. Likewise also, deeds that are good are quite evident, and those which are otherwise cannot be concealed. Hopefully you see the point he's making, right? He says, truth and time go hand in hand. Watch a young man, and you'll watch the little breadcrumbs of his life, and that'll lead to the source of who he is. You know, you watch the fruit of his life, and that'll lead to the root of who he is. Just go truth and time, go slow, he says, and then you'll know then you'll know if he's truly called into the ministry. Now, I think, friends, this morning, I hope we all get this, the importance of going slow, right? I mean, just real quick, who's a father in here of a daughter? Wow, okay, lots of baby girls. All right, what's our biggest fear, dads? Having a daughter? See, the big smiles, every man in here is united on this. What is it? You raised this little girl. She is cute as a button. She walks like a princess. Her long flowing hair, she sits on your lap so much better than our little boys, the smelly big feet, right? And you invest in her and you guide her and you train her and you love her. She's just, just different than your sons. What's your biggest fear? Talk to me now. You know exactly what it is. It's when, when, it's when the goon guy shows up and says, oh, I think I could actually take care of her better than you, you know. He's got his hoodie up. He's like, yeah, I got this, bro. <laughs> now, why are we all so worried about Goon Boy? Because if they truly fall in love and they're walking down that aisle together, you and I both understand something that they don't even understand yet, which is what? If God forbid that marriage fails. What does it feel like for everyone the entire family fails? Is that not true? The emotional hurt, the physical hurt, the financial consequences, the spiritual consequences, and we're watching them walk the aisle and we're thinking, oh Lord, please just help them to finish this thing well. That's what Paul's saying to you as the bride of Christ. He says, before you get married to a leader, you make sure that you go slow and you make sure that it's the right one. Because if that leader fails, it is going to feel like the whole family failed. And every single person in here who's been in a church that had a leader who went through a moral blowout knows exactly what I mean. It felt like a part of you was being lost. I've actually been responsible for this. There was a young guy, so talented, magnetic, good looking and I too early and leaders at the church that I was at we too early took this young man and we put him into a ministry over a ton of people it didn't work he got resentful he almost lost his family and to this day when I think about him and I pray for him I realize I was complicit I was complicit in that one. See, friends, when it comes to the family of God, humanly speaking, everything rises and falls on leadership. What Paul's saying is, listen, if you have 
solid leaders of integrity, care for them and protect them. If you've got guys that are immoral, they've got to immediately be dealt with. And if you have young men, then go slow. Test them, temper them, make sure they're ready. Because once you get married, their failure can very quickly become yours. Thank you.